five different issues based on those five different branches of philosophy I just mentioned. So the first issue we see is in verses 13 through 14, and it's this, a secular worldview of philosophy denies the reality of God and his providence. Let me read those verses for us again so you don't think I'm just making this stuff up. Here's what it says. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. So we see that first issue is that it denies the reality of God and his providence. Here's the problem. Humans think they can control things that only God controls. And so a secular worldview of philosophy sees the only reality being from human wisdom and human self-sufficiency as the answer to that big question about is God real and is his providence even real? Does he have any control over anything? It answers that question purely from a human standpoint. It deletes him. Then it shows, he shows a second issue that is addressed here in verses 15 through 18, and it's this. It develops man-made ethics. So we see that, again, verse 15 through 18. Let me read those for you. In my vain life, I've seen everything. There's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. There's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. So what we see here is this kind of relativity of values. He, he compares wickedness with righteousness here, and it's, so it's kind of relative to the person's experience. Humans set the standard for those things. If it's not coming from God, then it's kind of ever-changing. And ultimately, it sounds kind of confusing here. He's like, I'm going to be overly righteous. I thought that was the goal of life. His point is self-righteousness. That means you determine what righteousness is. Not that God has determined righteous, but you. So it's self-righteous. So a secular worldview, what it does is it sees these ever-changing values that we, we see these ethics, these morals, as really the answer to the question there. And it doesn't work. Then he sees a third issue in verses 19 through 22, and this is it. It distorts logic. Let me read those verses for us. Wisdom gives strength to the wise more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. See, these arguments for human wisdom are illogical when, some, when one actually considers the inconsistency of them all. Did you see what he says there? You're not wanting to be cursed by other people, but you've got no problem cursing them in return. So what a secular worldview does, it sees justifying one's own reasoning as the actual answer to this big question, which doesn't work. Then there's a fourth issue in verses 23 through 25, and it's this. It misunderstands knowledge. Let's read those verses again. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and to scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. He says here that, hey, look, everything's just way too complex when we really, really look at it. Knowledge can't be found. So what do humans do? They make up theories. They just come up with these ideas to try to figure it out. He calls it the scheme of things. That's what humans tend to do. So a secular worldview thinks the answer is through speculation. But there's one more thing here to note, and that's in verses 23, 26 to 28, and it's this. People are attracted to the wrong things with a secular worldview. Let's finish this up here and read these verses. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets, and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her. 
but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. You're like, wow, that guy's a real chauvinist. That's not what he's actually talking about here. I, I know it's easy to think about it in that way, but what he is saying here, he's giving actually a picture. It's a metaphor. People are drawn to the worldly beauty of foolishness that ensnares like an adulterous woman. If you read the Proverbs, that's oftentimes this talk of an adulterous woman that's here. He's picking up on that here because a secular worldview sees lust as the answer. We can see from all five of these things, this is not the way it was supposed to be. So what was philosophy originally supposed to be? As we've seen every week, we've got to go back to the beginning of the Bible, the first three chapters, to really see what happened. When God created the first human beings, we see in Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve, man, they had it perfect. They lived in a garden with everything they needed. And this is important to know about Adam and Eve, the first humans. They were created good, and they were created moral. That's very, very important to understand to begin with. And this was their philosophy to life as a result in the beginning. They trusted in God's providence. They lived by his ethical standards. They learned from him directly. They were never irrational and illogical at the beginning, and they found beauty in his wisdom. So what happened? We go a chapter over into Genesis chapter 3, and we see the fall of humanity, where Adam and Eve listen to Satan, who has embodied a serpent, and has tricked them into believing that God's withholding something from them. So in that moment, they choose to disobey and seek out their own philosophy to life. They wanted now autonomy from God and to develop their own schemes to live in. And that's exactly what occurs after they fall from sin. We see that their, their ancestors, everybody that follows after them, their children, their grandkids, everybody, go into this. They make up all these different schemes for things. Genesis chapter 6, what happens? God brings a flood. He's done with the philosophy of human life. And so he wipes out everybody except for eight people. But sin even continues into those eight people. And it ain't long before we get to Genesis 11. We get the Tower of Babel. And he confuses their language because that's another scheme of things. It's been the same ever since the garden. And it's been growing worse even up to our day. Now, as we kind of illustrate this and we think about it, I know that was kind of some intense stuff. But it's important to know where all this is coming from. Because, you got, man, I, I didn't study philosophy in school. And I don't really care about this. I get that. But here's the problem. You have a philosophy to life. Everybody does. Every human being has some sort of philosophy to their life and how they want to live. We have a lot of common examples today that we might hear as we go about our lives. Here's a few just to help you think and realize you actually do have a philosophy to how you live your life. Here's one. What goes around comes around. That's a popular one today, right, that people might throw out. Here's another one. Live in the moment. A lot of people use that one. This is probably the most popular one in this day and time. Do whatever makes you happy. That's a philosophy to life many are using. Here's one on one side of the coin. Play it safe. That may be your philosophy to life. On the flip side, take big risks. So those are two different philosophies. They're two different types of people. Some people just want to have fun. So their philosophy to life is... Just don't take life seriously. And that's kind of their mantra, their motto that they use. And of course, we have people like the great sage Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights that said this. Just go fast, right? So, I mean, any of those could be co-opted today, right? But sadly, many Christians have unsuspectedly adopted these worldviews, these same philosophies, none of which are biblical, none of which are Christian. And as a result, we act like this. It's going to sting a little. We act like practical atheists. We talked about this on Wednesday night. I heard some grumbling. They're like, what? You just call me that? It's true. We talked about this on Wednesday night in Psalm 14. But this is what it means to be a practical atheist. Watch this. It means our philosophy to life denies God and his word, even though we say we believe in God 
and we believe his word. So when we pull these philosophies into our life, we're not living as people who really believe. That's not what's shown in our lifestyle. The truth of the matter is this. This is not the way the philosophy of life is supposed to be. So what does this observation result in? The implication of it is this. Take note, philosophy is meaningless. Most weeks you're like, I hate when we say this thing is meaningless. But this week you're probably like, great, I agree. It is meaningless. But, but watch this. How is philosophy meaningless? Well, what we've seen is because the brokenness of sin and living under the sun and with this secular worldview, this perspective that we have, it distorts in all aspects the philosophy of life. And he shows us this in verse 29. Watch this. He says this. See, this alone I found. He did find one thing, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. See, all these human schemes, all these philosophies that are ungodly, they just prove how sinful we are. We've got a kind of a fancy term in Christianity we use, and it's called depravity. That means that we really are consumed by sin much more than we realize. And what he's really trying to make a point of saying, it goes back to the very first verse, is this. It's not that the world we live in is crooked. It's that we as humans are crooked. And so Solomon says, because of that, he's lived a vain life. He says that in verse 15. That's a tough thing to say about yourself. He's been trying to find out all the answers to the big questions of life through secular philosophy. But guess what? This is what we need to know. If this is the wisest human who's ever lived, and he says it's too deep for him to understand, then we need to realize it is for us. Why is that? It's because of this. When God and his design are not central into answering life's big questions, it's going to lead to what he said about himself, vanity. And we've talked about this every week. Vanity is probably better translated as meaninglessness. And that's the overall theme of Ecclesiastes. Every passage focuses in on that. Because a human-centered, secular worldview of philosophy is meaningless because it's rooted in human pride and it can't really explain how everything works. The truth of the matter is, if we're honest about it, we know that we can't find out the answers to our questions with only using this. So, how does this look like in our life? Well, I did take some philosophy courses in seminary. I didn't take them in high school, and I didn't take them in, in college. But when I got to seminary, they said, you're going to take Christian philosophy, and you're going to take secular philosophy, and you're going to see those two things together. I'm going to tell you, oh, my brain was in knots with that stuff. I mean, I just talked about it a little bit with y'all, and I know you can feel it. It's just kind of a crazy thing. Because as I started looking at human philosophy, secular philosophy, I saw that it can't explain things. It's true. You just go around in circles. The big takeaway that we need to see with it, as we saw from Solomon, is it's inconsistent. It tries to answer questions, but it's not consistent overall. It's inconsistent with God's reality. They might say there's a belief in God, but he's not a God that's close by. He's not one that's in your life. He's not there. He's like far off, like some sort of watchmaker that set everything in motion and took off. He's not really in our lives. There's inconsistency with that. That's, that's not who God is, right? It's inconsistent with eth ethics we see today, too. Like we look around our world, changing morals based on changing cultural preferences. Some of you who are a little bit more seasoned have seen over the decades how quickly this has changed, right? When you were kids, my goodness, could you have fathomed what's considered good, what's moral, what's right to date? Huge changes just in recent decades. It's also inconsistent with logic. People got these like seemingly solid arguments. They're like, look like they got it all together. You're like, man, it's gonna be really hard to refute it. Then they get to this one thing like, oh, it's like that thing right there, it's different. Don't worry about that. I don't use the same logic for that thing there. You know where I'm going with this, and I won't even, we don't have time to get into it. But in our day, everybody seems like they've got this great argument, but they've always got these exceptions to the rule showing their inconsistency. Same thing with knowledge. It's inconsistent today, right? We, we were taught that theories are facts. What's the main one? Evolutionary theory. It's not evolutionary science or evolutionary truth. It's the theory of evolution. Oh my goodness, it's ingrained into everything we see and do and experience. It can't be proven. 
But it's a theory, but nonetheless, we're totally inconsistent. We learn our life around something like that. Obviously, inconsistent with aesthetics, too. Beauty standards change constantly. What was cool back, you know, in the 90s, unfortunately, it's come back, like the women's chunky shoes, some of those kinds of things. What, like, the, the, there's some styles that just keep kind of coming back around, but some just consistently keep changing, right? And in our hypersexualized culture, it's amazing what we think of as actual beauty compared to just even 100 years ago, right? What we know from all those examples is that such a worldview is futile. It's meaningless because it can't explain everything, and it's inconsistent. So what does this indicate? The interpretation is this. Take note. Philosophy needs redemption. Yes, it does. Because there's kind of two big problems that are really crying out for this thing to be redeemed, to be rescued. The first problem that we obviously have seen here is that secular philosophy begins with humans rather than begins with God, the creator of humans. So because of this, it emphasizes human autonomy from God rather than dependence on him. But what we know from that and what we've seen as a result, it leads to nowhere when you do that. It needs rescue from this futility as we've seen as Solomon shows. But a second problem arises from this as well. It believes that humans are neutral rather than corrupted by sin. People aren't necessarily really good, and they aren't necessarily evil. They come out sort of neutral, and that's sort of it. Maybe you do some simple things here and there. But Solomon's investigation proves the total depravity of humanity, and it corrupts all of human philosophy. So it also needs rescue from harmful corruption. All of this makes us desperate for a return back to Eden. That's what we really want, right? What was lost? We want to know the answers to these big Questions And philosophy needs to be redeemed because it's been impacted by sin. And the best way to describe it, the redemption that really needs to occur is this. It is just a dead end that leads nowhere good without God at the center of it. We know that that's where the redemption needs to occur. We don't want to take dead ends. Think about dead ends in your life, right? I mean, how many of those signs do you see on roads? Around here, you know, it might be there's two signs, there's dead end, and the other one's no outlet. They basically mean the same thing. Living in the mountains and living in the country, we know, we interpret those a little bit different than maybe city folks do, but we know that if you go up a road that has one of those signs, that ultimately some things can happen to you. One thing is somebody could be waiting with a shotgun up there for you. You potentially could get shot. You probably shouldn't go up that road, right? We know that to be true. We also know we can get up there and get, like, stuck in the mud. Like, for some reason, the mud puddles just gather at the end of those roads, and then you drive up there, you didn't know it ended, or you didn't know, you still went anyway, and you get stuck. Or you get up there, and there's trees so tight, and they're right there at the end, and there is no lollipop at the end to turn around. So you ain't doing a three-point turn to get out. You're doing a 23-point turn to get out. You know what I'm talking about? One of those is just, like, constant going around, doing those things, right? We get that with road signs that say no outlet or dead ends. And like these roads ending, that's exactly what secular philosophy is like. There's no answers to it at all. The big questions just lead to more, the big answers, the answers to the big questions just lead to more questions is the problem. There's no true deliverance. It just leads to frustration. So where are we going to find redemption? For this. It's going to obviously have to come not from below, here uh, below the sun. It's going to have to come from above the sun. So here's the resolution. Take note. Philosophy finds meaning in Jesus Christ. We saw this answer this morning and what Scott read in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 26. And I'm not going to read it all again, but it no doubt gives us this truth. What does it say there? I'm going to read just a couple of verses, not all of it. But there are some important things to see here to help us to see that he really is the truth of this. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Obviously, he's quoting him there, right? And are justified by his grace as a gift. Though the, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. 
He was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What we need to know is this. Jesus is the answer to everything. He is the answer to all of life's big questions. Why is that? Let me break it down for us here for just a few moments. Here, here's what we need to know. Jesus is the answer to the question of the ultimate reality of God. I mean, what we know about Jesus is, yes, he was a human, but he was God in the flesh. So God became a human being living amongst his creation. We know that God is real because Jesus is real. But it's more than that. Jesus is the answer to the question of true knowledge. You need to understand that in the Gospel of John at the very beginning, he calls Jesus the Word of God. Yes, this is the Word of God. It is written down based upon what God spoke to the prophets and the apostles. But Jesus was the embodiment of everything that God ever wanted to say to humanity. He is the Logos, the Word of God. So Jesus is the truth made known to us. He's the answer. But he's more than that, too. Jesus is the answer to the question of correct moral values. Did you see that in Romans, what we just read? His perfect righteousness was given to us through his sacrificial death on a cross because there's no one righteous before a holy God. So Jesus is the answer to the life that we need. He was given for us. But Jesus is also the answer to the question of proper reasoning. Don't you love reading the Gospels? He's got this great logic they can never refute. He brings up something, they bring up something every time. Jesus lays a smack down on everybody, right? He's got the perfect logic, and he is the way that we are to follow with our own logic as we talk to other people. And finally, Jesus is the answer to the question of beauty. It says that he was not anyone that you would have found beautiful when he was walking here on earth, but his majestic beauty was found in many ways. First off, he was raised from the dead, but it's also going to be seen in his return. He's going to come with eternal life and restore the beauty of Eden. He's going to make straight which was once crooked because there's going to be no more sin. So that means that the gospel of Jesus Christ his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection that defeated sin and accomplished salvation is the solution to the meaninglessness of all of life, including life's big questions. So, if we know that, if we know that Jesus, that life is meaningless without him, what must we do? Here's how we apply it to our lives. Here's how we can take some next steps. Write this down. Philosophy must have a gospel-centered worldview. So, obviously, we need a Christian philosophy to life and not a secular philosophy to life. And matter of fact, Solomon shows us this at the end of the book. That's really where he's, he's written all this stuff, and it, it seems very confusing, but you get to the end, he gives you the answers. The last two verses, it says this, the end of the matter. He's explored everything, and this is the final thing he wants to say. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So in the end, everything matters to God. And we've got to see life not through our mere human perspective, but through a divine worldview. And so, folks, we've seen this every week, and I can't reiterate it enough. Our worldview matters. It's got to be a Christian worldview worldview. It's got to be a Christian philosophy that we've developed. And so for believers here this morning, if you've made a profession of faith in Christ, here is how you can take the next step. Here's what we can do. To begin, to do the right thing, we've got to know what we shouldn't do. And what we shouldn't do is continue to keep looking for answers to life's big questions from our secular world. We've got to stop doing that because they're just dead ends with inconsistent theories that never pan out, right? Instead, as we saw this morning, we need to see Jesus as the answer to all of our questions. And so here it is. Here's the next step. And this is a very big paradigm shift for church people. I'm just, when I tell you this, you're going to know what I mean. Because we have been taught growing up that we don't ask questions. 
When we go to church, when we pray, when we talk to God, when we hang out with Him, we don't ask Him questions. We just, by faith, gladly do whatever, and, and we don't worry about these things. But inside of us, there's this turmoil. We want to know life's big questions. We want to know the answers to those. So here's your next step. Bring all your questions to God. That's what the Bible actually teaches us to do. He wants to answer them. And he's given you a whole book full of the answers. All we have to do is press in. They're right here. Now, this ain't a science book. It's, it is a history book to a certain extent, but it doesn't tell us everything. But it gives us the right worldview. It helps us to have a Christian philosophy of life. God wants to answer your questions. You just need to know where to look. But if you're not a follower of Jesus today, if you call yourself a non-believer, I don't know what you would say, but if you haven't made the step of following Jesus, I need to tell you this. There's a terrible pattern if you go and actually study human philosophers throughout even just the modern era, the last couple of hundred years. You're going to find out that those people search all over the place trying to answer the big questions of life. They came up with something like some really good ideas. And almost all of them died miserable and alone and confused. And the fact of the matter is, while you may not be one of these great philosophers, you have a philosophy to your life. And you're going to end up going down that same pattern as them. If these are super intelligent people who have done it, you've got to realize that you are going to fall into the same trap. Your knowledge is not going to save you. Your self-righteousness, it's not going to save you. Your logic, it ain't going to save you. Your good works, they're not going to save you. They don't answer the problem of sin. And your sin, it separates you from a holy God for all eternity. And as we've read both in Ecclesiastes and Paul quoting him in Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nobody. You are not the exception to the rule. And that is bad news, I know. But there was good news that was provided today. God has the answers you're looking for. They've been given by his grace through his son and through his word. Jesus can set you free from the confusion and the dead ends. And he can give your life real meaning. So what do you need to do today? It's simple. You need to repent. That means just to turn from going your way and your own philosophy of life and turn towards Jesus and follow his way. Repent of your sins and put your faith in him, and you can experience a life of meaning. So that leads us now to a time of invitation. We've heard a key observation. Philosophy is not what it was supposed to be. We saw an implication of that, that philosophy is meaningless. We saw a big thing that we need to consider, this interpretation of it all. is like philosophy definitely needs redemption, right? But fortunately, we find meaning in Jesus Christ for philosophy, and that means we have to put the gospel glasses on. Our worldview, as we look at things, has to put Jesus squarely in the middle of it. Because God wants us to have a life of meaning, y'all. He doesn't want us to be miserable. He doesn't want us to be confused all the time and never be able to find any answers. And for some of you today, that invitation for a life of meaning, and that's the first time. Would you trust in Jesus today? But for the rest of us, man, we've got to get serious about having this gospel-centered worldview. Because we've got a philosophy to life. So let's make sure it's his. Let's do this seriously and specifically. So we need to answer this big question. Everybody in here today, myself included, where are you looking for answers to life's big questions in the wrong places? Are you only looking to, and some of these things can be helpful, but they're not the only place you can look. Are you looking only to secular media for the answers to life? Some of you, you probably are. Some secular news outlets, it's going on in the background all the time. The answers aren't there. Secular education, there's a lot of good stuff to learn out there, but it's not going to give you the answers to the big questions of life. Some of you, you're looking at secular relationships, which is a really dangerous road to go down. And others of you, maybe it's secular lifestyle. I don't know what it is in your life, but would you write that down on the blank on your outline and bring it to Jesus this morning for redemption? Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Philosophy is something we think we don't really deal with, but we all have a philosophy to life. And Father, I just want to come to you and ask for forgiveness for where we've missed the mark with that. We've listened so heavily to our culture that is ungodly today, unfortunately. Things have changed rapidly. 
and we've justified our sin, we've, we've tried to come up with theories, but we're inconsistent, we know it. Would you break our hearts this morning, pinpoint, Holy Spirit, where it is in our life that we're looking for answers in the wrong places, and help us to respond to your word accordingly. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing a song of invitation. Maybe you can come today and leave that thing at the altar, that, that place that you've got in your life. Or, or maybe you want to pray with me and be glad to do that. Or maybe you want to give your life to Jesus. I'm not sure what it is. But would you respond to the Lord as he is leading you today?